Um, flavor of the month again, leave the old DHS and get in with uh, nailing. All the big boys do nailing, but um, is that really true? So the goals of, of any fracture treatment are one, to restore your anatomy. You should have a secure fixation to allow early or immediate walking and to minimize or prevent any complications. So the questions <coughs> that we are looking to answer really is the sliding hip screw or the dynamic hip screw, uh, is it an obsolete implant today? Are trochantric nails really the best thing uh, that is available? And whatever of these two you choose to use, how do you minimize the complications? So sliding hip screw historically, um, for all those of you who are um, doing post-graduation now is, is the only implant um, that you know uh, for the treatment of intertrochantric fractures and that it was a successor to the uh, Jewett fixed nail plate device. So the sliding allows for a controlled uh, collapse, allowing your fracture surfaces to uh, come together, <coughs> allowing your fracture surfaces to come together and avoiding or minimizing the chance of penetration of the implant. But we still see so often this kind of a picture where the screw is uh, cutting out. So what is the problem here? Is it a question of bone quality? Is it a question of what kind of implant you are using? or is it a problem with the surgeon who put the implant in. <laughs> and here uh, one of the sort of important concepts which actually is quite old, uh, Baumgartner de described it in 95 actually, the concept of a tip apex uh, distance where if you take with magnification adjusted the distance between the tip of the implant and the center of the head on the AP and the cent center of the head and the tip of the implant on the lateral um, and add both of those. Um, if you are less than 25 millimeters of that combined thing, the chances of cutout are zero. Yeah? When they studied their uh, 198 patients, they found that in 120 who had a tip apex distance of less than 25, there was zero cutouts and these are all elderly patients with similar kind of osteoporotic picture across both groups. This tip apex distance is valid for a dynamic hip screw. It is valid for intramedullary devices which have a single implant in the head. So the word to remember is central and deep. That is what the placement of your uh, head implant should be. When I was a resident, uh, low and posterior we were taught is what protects your uh, uh, implant from cut out because there is more bone through which it has to cut out and in, in fact it is the other way around. These studies show that implants which are placed in the posterior and inferior quadrants have a higher rate of cut out than implants which are placed in the center center position. So again uh, out of 120 cases which had a TAD or tip apex distance of less than 25 in Baumgartner series and this is shown in other series too, there was no cutout. <laughs> but sliding devices do have a problem in certain kind of fractures. One of them is in this kind of a reverse intertrochantric where this proximal fragment can displace laterally, the distal fragment displaces medially and you land up with a situation um, like that. Now, in these sliding devices, um, excess collapse, sometimes in, in certain situations you do get uh, quite a lot of collapse, 15.7 millimeters was the average amount and another report which showed that the more the amount of uh, collapse, when it was more than 15 mm, there was an increased incidence of failure of your fixation. So you want a situation which allows collapse but not too much collapse. Because too much collapse causes shortening of the limb when your uh, tip of the trochanter is you know coming closer to the head of the uh, femur, you will get an abductor dysfunction and then your dynamic device which has got space to settle down has settled down to its maximum 
and it now becomes a fixed angle device. <laughs> the second concept which you have to um, remember is that of a lateral wall fracture and many of us, I myself included, um, do not or till recently did not recognize the importance of this. Where an innocuous looking fracture like this fixed with a DHS <laughs> develops a fracture of the lateral wall ultimately leading to excessive collapse, excessive uh, medialization of the distal fragment and in more severe cases it can lead to a failure of your fixation. So this was um, reported by Palm et al in 2007 where they looked at the integrity of the lateral femoral wall in IT fractures and <coughs> found that out of the 214 patients, 168 had an intact lateral wall and out of these 168, only 3 percent, only 5 of those patients had a problem, you know, had to undergo surgery again within 6 months. Whereas out of 46 who had a fractured lateral wall in the post-operative x-rays, 22 percent required a re-operation. That's a significant difference. So a compromised or a broken lateral wall is a significant predictor for uh, re-operation. And the other important thing in their study was 74 percent of these fractures of the lateral wall occurred in the time of surgery, at the time of surgery. They were not there in the pre-operative x-ray, but they were there in the post-operative x-ray. So <coughs> lateral wall fracture occurred only in 3 percent of the patients who had what we call as a stable fracture, that is uh, AO or uh, OTA type A1, A2, A3 or A2.1, these are the stable. But it occurred in 31 percent of patients who had unstable fracture patterns that is A2.3 and A2.2. <laughs> so the AO classification where the A1 basically is two part fractures, A2 is more than two part but A2.1 is a relatively small posteromedial fragment, 2.2 is posteromedial fragment with multiple fragments and uh, 2.3 is definitely multifragmentary. So these are the stable group and 2.2 and 2.3 are the unstable group. So to prevent this collapse there are multiple things that you can do. One is to use some form of a trochantric buttress plate or use an intermedullary nail or use a fixed angle device. <laughs> but even a trochantric buttress plate like this is not always the answer in this particular situation. It has uh, worked well, but it does become a fixed angle device. Overall, the uh, rate of complications for this is uh, higher. It requires a larger exposure and it does not always work like in this case. Despite the presence of the trochantric buttress plate, it has shortened and there is penetration of the implant. So the trochantric nail is definitely a, a good thing for a reverse obliquity fracture, but probably also a good thing for unstable intertrochantric fractures. And this is designed for insertion through the lateral, uh, through, through the tip of the trochanter. It has this uh, valgus offset on the proximal side. Biomechanically, at least theoretically, it is superior to the uh, side plate because this is an intramedullary implant so there is a shorter moment arm and there could possibly be a, le uh, there is a lesser ten tensile strain on the implant which could lead to lower rates of um, failure. <laughs> you do not need to have an intact lateral wall to put this implant in. It does have a complication um, rate but this is now coming down with better designs and more um, experience. So this kind of a fracture, now this looks like a relatively simple, uh, you know, two part with a trochantric fragment. Is it a 2.1 or a 2.2? If you look at it carefully enough, you will notice there is a fairly large uh, lesser trochantric fragment and multiple fragments that you can see. So this is a 2.3 at risk for 
breakage of the lateral wall which again you can see is quite thin. So this kind of a fracture is probably a good indication for using an intramedullary um, device like so, ream it, put in the nail, <laughs> we stopped, okay, uh, put in the nail, put in the guide wire and this what you see here is actually where you should be um, aiming for, where the compression and the tensile trabeculate decussate, the center of the head, that is where you have the maximum amount of uh, bone and the maximum amount of purchase. And if you start aiming for this, as you, as you go in, at this portion you will definitely feel the um, resistance, which leads ultimately then to an uneventful uh, healing. Again a similar case, treated with an intramedullary device, heals. These look fairly simple, but if you, you, you have to sort of look at it carefully to decide whether this is a 2.1 or a 2.2. Uh, there are some fractures, especially those which have a neck fracture like this, which may not be amenable to a nailing also and they may be, uh, they may require some kind of a fixed angle device, probably a blade plate. Nowadays there is a lot of talk of locking plates, but even they have um, their own problems. So at the moment for fractures which have um, you know, a neck component, uh, probably a blade plate is a good option. So for stable fractures, you can use a sliding hip screw. For unstable fractures or fractures with a subtrochantric or reverse intertrochantric element, uh, probably an intramedullary nail. And for fractures which have got the neck um, element also, some kind of a fixed angle device would be useful. But so is, is the hip screw or dynamic hip screw a bad implant to use? Absolutely not. Even a paper as late as 2005 <laughs> with a fairly large number of um, unstable fractures, 75 percent unstable fractures uh, with a follow up of one year has shown only a um, 3.6 percent rate of complication and a 2.6 percent rate of uh, reoperation. So sliding hip screw is definitely not. Um, out, use what you are best at, but for certain fractures it may be not, it may not be a bad idea to develop experience with an intramedullary device. Thank you.